Hey, because of the weather outside, make sure if you're online, thank you. Make sure you share it, hit it, like it. We can reach as many people as you can uh, when we're doing that. In this room, we're going to look at everybody. Everybody just look at somebody and say, hi, 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 hi. It's good to see you. Okay, I gave you a second. You, you just burned up 15. All right, like stop. Stop, 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 stop. I got a lot to say for you before I'm on my way out. So we're going to continue our series uh, called Third Time's a Charm because we don't want you to think just because 2020 was a bummer, 2021 was a bigger bummer, 2022 does not have to be the biggest bummer. It could be the best season ever for LaGrange First Church of God. Amen. And there were things that I believe during this uh, message that God put on my heart, things that I felt like I wanted to share with all of you uh, as we continue to move out, because I believe third time's a charm for us and the world, because the church is the hope of the world. Isn't that exciting to know you're the hope of the world? Not just Bob, all right? Like you as the church are the hope of the world. And so there were things we wanted to talk about, and I keep wanting to refresh these as, as we wind this down, okay? Because I got this, and I got my final week to, next week, okay? So first week, we talked about Emmanuel and how Emmanuel isn't just a Christmas uh, name for God. Emmanuel is God with us, as a matter of fact. Emmanuel, as we talked about, was actually God's plan all the way in the garden from the beginning, that God would walk with his people, and then his people messed it up. Adam and Eve messed it up, got kicked out of the garden, but God... God promised that he would put enmity, he would put a war, and that war would eventually crush uh, the serpent evil in this world, and we will one day be restored in a perfect body in heaven, and that will be amazing. Amen? Amen. And then the next week, we focused on making sure that we are listeners of the word and not hearers of the word. Because sometimes hearers of the word are people that kind of, I know that's there, but I'm not really going to follow that. I'm going to pick up and do what God wants me to do. We talk about King Saul. Remember that? Like he was getting a little nervous before he went to war and he decided to do the priest stuff that Samuel was going to do, but he came impatient. He's like, I'll just take over God's job and I'll do it myself. And then last week we talked about focus and how God doesn't want us going through the motions. And we talked about Isaiah one and uh, how I watched that this morning at the gym. That was kind of a, it's a rough message. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. It's kind of a scary message and God's people need to be a little bit scared every now and then. Amen. We do. We need to remember that if we're just going through the motions and our focus isn't on him, God does not like that type of worship. And we talked about that. And so now as we go into this, we talk to Emmanuel, we talk being listeners, we talk about having our focus on Jesus. Today, I want to talk about how LaGrange has got talent. You have talent. I want you to say it out loud on the count of three. Say, I have talent. I want you to type that in. One, two, three. Oh, come on. All right. You, you got to be excited about this. All right. One, two, three. I have talent. Now, I want to kind of explain this because uh, I'm not getting lazy. Some of you go, oh, I'm not getting lazy here. But the message today I want you to know, okay, is I uh, ripped off a part of Jesus' sermon. One of the longest sermons Jesus ever gave. And I just took one point from his sermon, and I'll show you how I can turn that into a whole long sermon on top of it just by taking one of Jesus' points. And you guys are like, uh-oh, if he's saying it's long, it's going to go really long, okay? Now, <laughs> this week, I knew God put this passage on my heart, but I'm going to be honest with you, okay? I was a little like, why this passage? Why, why this one, Jesus? Because it's one I have spoken on once since I've been here, but I, 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 I kind of, I, I know what he told me to say, and I've been faithful to study the text, but I'm like, really, what is it you want from me? And then I caught a rerun of Seinfeld. Now, some of you are not Seinfeld fans, and I know sometimes people don't like if I, you know, reference a little bit of secular pop culture, but go with me, okay? If God can speak through Satan and his words are even inspired in the Bible, then he can surely speak through George Costanza, okay? And <laughs> there are two, I, this week I got to see two different episodes of Seinfeld, and if you're a Seinfeld fan, you'll know this, okay? The first one is where George was trying to keep this girl liking him that didn't like him, so he thought, okay, I'll leave well. And every time I leave, I'll sing my last name as I walk out the door and go, Costanza. 
And every time he left, people would go, I want more. Because he'd say his name in such a catchy way, like on a commercial you always order. This girl he'd like, he'd stare and she'd like, get out, George. And he'd go, okay, Costanza. And then she became addicted to hearing that end little theme on top of it. But the better one I saw was later on in this, the, you know, the seasons of Seinfeld is when all of a sudden he decided he wanted people to fall in love with him. So he would always leave every meeting everywhere he went on a high note. So the moment he could be going through, he could be just talking, talking, talking. The moment he told a joke and everyone laughed, George would go, okay, I'm leaving on a high note. And he'd just walk out of the conversation because he said something. Uh, he ended on a high note and walked out. And he knew this. People would always want to hear him more because of of how he left. And there is something I'm going to give. Oh, I'm so glad you're here, Patty. I got a gift for you, girl. I got a gift for you, Bonnie. Because over the years, as I've been here, I, I've had several requests and it's never, it's not a bad thing at all. Uh, people have often wanted me to talk about the end times. You excited now? Patty, I see you, Pat. All right, you're up, all right? So I thought I want you to know as I uh, am finishing here, I don't want anybody to ever think that I am not somebody who definitely believes that there is going to be an end time. I also saw somebody who believes that we are living in the end times. And when I leave, I want you to think highly of me that I don't believe Jesus isn't coming back because I can't wait till he comes back. Hallelujah. Okay, so what I decided to do, I figured it out, okay, because I want to leave well on a high note and I want people to remember things. I don't want you to think for one minute that I don't believe Jesus is coming back. I don't want you to think right now for one minute at all, okay, that I don't believe there are end times. And so I decided to go to Matthew 25 and I want everybody in this room to open your Bibles to Matthew 25 online app, Bible app, however it is you do it, open this thing up because Matthew 25 is probably the longest end time sermon. It is. This, there's no doubt about this. It is the longest end time sermon in the Bible. Now, a lot of times we don't think about it like that, but there's actually a lot going on in this text. And I'm going to let you all walk out of here feeling super smart this morning. Okay. We're going to use some big nerd words. All right. You, you want to use, learn some big nerd words? Yeah. All right. Here we go. All right. So In Matthew 25, understand the context, okay? So it's Holy Week. Jesus has come to the end of his ministry. He's he's gone to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover where he eventually will be betrayed. He will have a mock trial. He will be put on the cross to die for my sins, your sins, and all uh, those who he calls his church through all time. He died for our sins, all right? And this is the Passover week, the Holy Week that he came in. Now, he didn't just show up on the, you know, on the day of the Passover to get crucified and all that stuff. That's not what happened, okay? He came for the entire week and he came with his disciples. And as he rides in, we know we're familiar with Palm Sunday, but a lot of times we don't talk about those few, you know, those few chapters in between. Now, after Jesus has been there a couple days, he and the disciples, Jesus would go in and teach and he and his disciples are walking out uh, two days before the Passover, okay? And they're walking out and disciples are walking out just looking at Jerusalem, just like, wow, Jesus, this, this is just amazing. And then Jesus like sits down after the disciples are in awe of Jerusalem, okay? And they're just like, wow. And unlike uh, George Costanza or my desire to leave on a super high note and make everybody happy, Jesus lays out a very, 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 almost cryptic, scary chapter, if we think about it, for those who do not believe in Jesus or hopeful for all of us who can't wait for Jesus to come back. Amen? And so as he's sitting there and the disciples are caught up in, you know, the big city, all of a sudden they're like, wow, Jesus, look at all this. And then Jesus leads into one day, everything you see, Jerusalem and everything you're infatuated with about here on earth is going to be destroyed. And as he starts talking about how it's going to be destroyed and all these things, he starts to talk even more about how there is going to be, and this is the first big word I want you to to think as we kind of navigate through this text, okay? He starts with something that we call eschatological, all right? You may have heard that word before. Eschatological is the study of end times. And so for the first part of the chapter, he talks about the signs of what things are going to look like before the end has come. 
And he's very cautious about this. And he lays things out that if you read this, you will see that it's almost as if you could open Matthew 25, read the first part about these things are going to happen before the end comes. And it's almost like you could match piece by piece at the beginning of the chapter and go, yep, that's happening. 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 And it should draw us as believers in right now. And then after he starts to tell him, these things will happen for the kingdom of God. Say that with me. Kingdom of God, all right, as it comes in. Then after he lays out the fact that it's going to happen, this, this is what it's going, it's going to look like, then he talks about how he will return and establish the kingdom of God. Now, as he talks about this, he then leads into the idea he will come back. So there's Advent, right? Advent season as we celebrate God coming to earth. But then he's going to start talking about a second Advent. Now, eschatology, okay, eschatological, eschatology is the, the study of the end, all right? Now we're talking about the second advent when Jesus will return. And as Jesus starts talking at the second, we'll call it his first point of his sermon, like sub point, all right, of his sermon, he talks about how he, no one knows when he's going to come back, but he's coming back. And then he starts talking about when he comes back, not everyone is going to get to go to heaven. And that's kind of a scary part of the sermon too. It's like, you know, there'll be two people working out in the field and all of a sudden one will be up, one will be down. He's giving this illustration about it, but it is not for us to know the time other than he's coming back. And then he goes into a parable. Now in a parable, parable is a story that didn't necessarily happen. They are teaching. He's trying to make a point. So he gives a, uh, this point about being ready for his return. I want you to say, be ready, being ready for his, we know he's going to return. This is what it's going to look like. You don't know the time, but you better be ready when he comes. And so he tells this parable about 10 virgins and how these 10 virgins are going to go be married to the bride. Think about that as God's people, uh, going to be married to Jesus at some point. And he talks about how half these women, uh, came and they were ready. They had lamps. Okay. And it said half of these women put oil in their lamps because they didn't know he was going to come back. He may come back at night. We don't think about Jesus coming back at night. Except we know this, Jesus is a light in the world, right? And we like to put light in dark places, so that feels pretty good to know we better be prepared. And if our mission is to put light in dark places, then you're in a good spot to be prepared. Amen? Because it's the widows who put oil in their lamps that were ready because the master came back at night. But there were five others who were too lazy to put the oil in their lamps, and so they weren't ready for his return. And so you remember you've got, okay, now you've got, you know, eschatological. Now you've got talking about this word advent. And now you're going to have kind of what we would call apocalyptic. Because apocalyptic is like the end of the world. Not the study of it, but it is apocalyptic and things are about to happen. And in this story, we will hear not just that he's coming back, we don't know, we need to be ready, but now in the parable we're going to study at this point, we are going to talk about what Jesus has an expectation for us to do and what we should look like on his return. And so we move in to a study we call the parable of the talents. Now, if you grew up in church, you may be familiar with this story. It's often talked about money and tithing and everything else. And the board asked me to slip this one in. So y'all get your tithing up before I, before I exit. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> because it's really not about money. Okay. It's about being a steward of the good things God has given us. Because one day we will finally meet the judgment seat of Christ and he will look at us. He will look at Bruce, he will look at Peter, he'll look at Mike, he'll look at Dwayne and say, what did you do with the talents I gave you? That's what this parable is about. So what do you have? You have an apocalyptic, eschatological, advent parable. How smart do you feel now? You're like, this, this ain't a sermon on tithing. This ain't even a sermon about tithing at all. Get ready, okay? This is the type of text you're dealing with at this point because this is like his third point to his sermon, okay? He will judge the living and the dead by what we have been given here on earth. And he will use a, for a word called talents. Now, 
I want us to just look at this at the very beginning. And I want us to just start reading in Matthew 25, verse 14. It says, it, again, it. So he, the it, I'm sorry, throughout this whole sermon he's been giving is the kingdom of God. So again, the kingdom of God will be like a man who is going on a journey. Who called his servants and he entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to uh, another one bag, each according to his ability. And then he went down on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went and at once put his money to work and he gave five more bags. So also the one who has two bags of gold gained two more. But the one who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and he hid his master's money. Now, most of your Bibles will not say bags of money. It will actually say talents. Now, there's nothing wrong with those two things because we think talent, you can in this text, it is okay to think about your talent as uh, your gifting. It's good to think about your talent as your money because all those things go together that God has given us things to help serve, to help follow him in the kingdom of God. Now, also, why would it say not talents in this text, but bags of money? Now, a talent, a lot of times people think is a coin. It, it is not what it is. A talent is actually kind of a uh, measurement of money, if you will. Now, one talent today would be considered worth $1.4 million. Austin Powers, right? $1.4 million. And... We need to understand there's three people, one who gets five talents, one who gets two talents, and one who gets one talent. But even the person who gets one talent gets $1.4 million. Pretty good, huh? And then understand this, all right, because I want this is important. These, this word that really stuck out to me was he was in, he, what, he entrusted them. Isn't it good to think about the fact that God entrusts you with talents, with gifts and abilities to do things? Now, this one guy who's given, you know, five uh, talents or five bags of money, we, we sometimes tend to think, right, like, well, he must have been the best. No, 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 not at all. What does it say? Each to his what? Own ability. He entrusted certain uh, talents to Dwayne. He entrusted certain talents to Lenoka. He entrusted certain talents to Gary based on their, ob uh, their own ability. God believed when he entrusted them that they would do something to further his kingdom based on the, the gifts, ability, or however he created them to finish out till he comes back. Second return of Jesus. And it's nice for me to think that God entrusted me with talent. It's nice for all of us to think that God entrusted all of us with some type of talent. Now, I think more importantly, it's for all of us to remember, it's not just that God gives talents, but God gives each of us talents. God gives all of you. He gives all of me talents or what we often call gifts. And I want you to look at this, okay? I want you to write down 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. Now, I had Jackie read all that. That was the whole, you know, half epistle Jackie wrote, <laughs> but just to steal one piece from this, okay, to think that God gives us talents. Those talents are to be used for the kingdom of God. Now, this is just a little sub note of this to show you that, but what? There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. They are all different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God to work. God has given all of us, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, his Holy Spirit. 
And with his Holy Spirit, who is God, and God means he is in us, gives all of us certain talents, okay, that have a supernatural ability. They are not something any of us could do on our own. They are gifts that has been just, you know, graciously bestowed on all of us. And all of us have different talents. We have been entrusted. I I want you to say entrusted. Say it out loud entrusted. He said, I trust you, Elisa, to use these gifts before I leave. And so as he is saying this, I want us to remember all of us have those same things, but they are not to be used for our personal gain. They are to be used for the body's personal gain. So each part of the body works together to edify Jesus Christ, to be a city shining on a hill that we shine so bright that people look at that city and they go, who has a God like you and praises him for that? This is what this apocalyptic, eschatological parable of an advent is starting to say, okay? We have a master. The master walks away at some point, which means he's gone back to heaven. He gave each of us gifts. And then you see what? These three people, the guy who was given five, the guy who was given two, and the guy who was given one, okay, talent. You see them and how they respond to what They have been given by God. And so if you pick up in the text, okay, I need you to understand something, okay? Because I called this message, LaGrange has got talent. Just like, you know, America's got talent. And I I actually don't like those shows. I can honestly say I've never watched a single episode, not a single episode of American Idol, because I just feel like literally if I know the Bible, I am watching a TV show about an idol, okay? (laughs) And then that spun off into all these other shows. And, and I know there's singing shows and acting shows, but the, I, I've heard of the bigger one and seen commercials for America's Got Talent. But the church has talent that will overcome the world. All right. Yeah, you can clap for that <laughs> because here's the deal. Okay. They've got talent to entertain. The Lord gave us talent to shine. All right. And so all of us in LaGrange have that talent who have been redeemed by Jesus Christ. Now, the funny part of all this, all right, that I need you to understand is here's what's going to happen next. There are winners. And I want you to hear this. All right. There are winners of this talent show, if you will, in this parable. If you pick back up in Matthew 25 and verse 19, it says, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and he settled accounts with them. So what is that? It's kind of like saying, after a long time, it's been a long time since Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. Amen? It's been 2,000 years almost. All right? So it's been a long time since that has happened. And so after a long time, he comes to settle accounts. What is settle accounts? It means he comes to judge. Do not forget the Bible talks about one day there will be a day of judgment. And even for those of us who have been redeemed By God, we'll have to look at him one day and give an account to everything we have done in our lives. And for those of you who have been faithful to serving God and using God with your talents, the Bible talks about giving you crowns and rewards and things of that nature. And for those who didn't know him, ooh, icky, scary, not going to end up well for one of these guys. So the man who had received five bags of gold, or think of a talent, uh, brought, uh, brought the master five master. He said, you entrusted me. All right. So he knows he's been trusted with the talent. Keep thinking about it. God trusted you, Doug, with a talent. God trusted you, Jace, with a talent. God trusted you, Phyllis, with a talent. He has trusted all of us who call on him as Lord with these talents. And this guy, this goes to his, what was he calling him? He calls him Master, you entrusted me with five, okay, and I have gained how many more? Five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Come share in your master's happiness. What's that mean? Come reign in heaven with your master. Sounds good, doesn't it? All right, he's going on to the second round. (laughs) And the man who had two bags of gold came, and what does he call him? Master. And he said, what? 
you entrusted me. So now the guy who knows too. Notice what he doesn't say. Well, because you gave me less, you didn't trust me more. Oh, oh let's just camp there for a minute. Because sometimes we go, oh, the pastor's got all five. Uh, if a shekel falls my way, maybe I'll do something with it. No, 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 no. He understood he was entrusted with what he was given. Think about that. All of you have still been entrusted with what he was given while you were here on earth. And the two bags of gold, uh, the two bags of gold, see, I've gained how many more? Two more. All right. So there is what? There is a doubling. The guy who understood he was entrusted by his master. It's important we see these words. All right. That he gained double. The guy who was given two bags calls him master, comes back and he says what? I have doubled what I have given, what you've given me. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come share in your master's happiness. Now, a Bible technique I have tried and tried over all my years to teach you is if you see patterns, pay attention. Now, do you see a lot of patterns in here between the first two people? This should get your attention really fast, especially if Jesus is telling you about an eschatological you know, apocalyptic, adventic parable, you better pay attention right now. This would scare them because they first started with how awesome Jerusalem is. And Jesus is like, you ain't seen nothing yet. Everything's about to get wrecked. Get ready. And they go into the story and they hear, okay, one was given five. He doubled that amount. And you heard the exact same words spoken to the one with five. And you hear the exact same words spoken to the servant that had two. Both his reward and every single word after that. He says, well done, good servant. You have been faithful with a few and I will put you in charge of many. And he says again to the same guy, come share in your master's happiness. You too have made it to the second round. (sighs) But here's the hard part. Now, if there are winners, oh, can I just correct postmodernism now? Okay. (laughs) Sometimes there's winners and sometimes there are losers because Jesus is not in the business of giving you a participation trophy. All right. This just does not fit, which also should have been at the beginning. You will know the end of the times is coming when people are giving out participation trophies. All right. (laughs) It says, then the man who received one bag of gold, get ready, master. So he's got that right word. It's repetitive, right? He said, and now he says, now we go off script. So this should, uh uh-oh, get ready. I knew that you're a hard man. You harvest where you have not sown and gathered where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went out and I put your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. What? Do you know what he's doing? Catch that. He is lying. He is lying. He is like my kid who gets caught with chocolate on their face. Just yesterday, Corbin, did you eat the whole blizzard? No. You know, chocolate everywhere. Can't stop running in circles. You know what I mean? Like, no, I didn't eat the whole blizzard. You know, he had chocolate on the face, sugar rush, crash. He didn't eat the, yes, he ate the whole blizzard. Now, why would he say something like this? Why would he talk about how harsh and mean he is? It's an excuse. It's an excuse to say, ooh, I didn't want to get in trouble. I didn't want to try because what if I, ooh, here it is. What if I fail? What if I lost? What if I tried and nothing worked? It's better off for me to just take what I was given and sit in the pew. And I'll just give it back to him when the master returns. We hear a whole different response. Matter of fact, we hear Simon Cowell's voice echoing through Jesus. All of a sudden, Jesus has a British voice. Wicked and faithful, Sibbet. (laughs) 
So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered. Notice the question mark there. That's him rhetorically going, so you knew I was like this? Well, that should have inspired him more, really, is what's going on. That's what Jesus is saying. Well, if you knew I was so hard, James, and I was like this, then why didn't you do something? Because this is what he says. Well, then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. $1.4 million and an interest rate of even 1% all the way back in Jerusalem would have yielded quite a harvest of money. 1.4 1.4 million today would yield quite a harvest of what? Money. <sighs> so take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be give, given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even when they have, they will, it will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be what weeping and gnashing of teeth so i want to ask you something okay all of us are you know yes amen and hallelujah to all things in the bible right I believe this. I believe that. It's the inspired word of God. Yes, I believe he's coming one day. Then all of us better ask ourselves this question right now. What have you been doing with your talents? What have you been doing with your talents? When you look at Jesus Christ, what is he going to say? Now, The question I just kind of want to ask is we kind of tie this whole part up of the sermon, knowing that he is one day going to come and has and gives us these talents, this worth, this ability. Notice what he does without even saying it. He respects what? A return on his investment. He expects that. And those who are rewarded doubled the talents. If you looked at your line of ministry throughout life, Have you doubled yourself? Have you been obedient to the Great Commission? Jesus' command to go make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, to teach them everything he taught unto them, and lo, he will be with you always to the end of days. Our sole job as all believers in Jesus Christ is to make disciples that make disciples that make disciples that makes disciples. You are a living inheritance of that command that Jesus gave 2,000 years ago. You know that? You've inherited that promise and that command from Jesus to go do that. And one day, all of us are going to look to him. And if there has been no return... On the investment he made in me and in you. And you said, you know what? Jesus, I heard some things about you. And so I decided to play it safe. I decided to sit. What does he say? Throw away the worthless servant outside where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Does that mean... You can go to hell. I know some people think I've been progressive and out of the box over the years, but let me assure you of this. I believe in a heaven and a hell. I believe in eternal life. I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way. I believe we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. That he did all the work for all of us when he died on that cross and rose from the dead. He gave us the most powerful weapon we could have in the Holy Spirit, his presence of God manifesting through us. And sometimes we don't use the talents, not because we, we don't care. I just, I, I wrote down three things that I asked myself. I'm like, why don't people use their talents? Why don't people get up and want to multiply? What, what happens? All right. One, I think there is a fear of failure. I think most of us see the need and we want to, but we're afraid that maybe if I even tried, I would fail. 
Beloved, do you want to know where I truly understood my call in preaching the word of God, wherever I am and wherever I was? It was through a pastoral transition. In my first church, I hadn't even been there a year. And the pastor just said, all right, God's calling me out. I've been waiting for a spirit-filled believer here. Tag in. Here I am, maybe two years, at, you know, from smoking crack. You know, <laughs> and now I'm in charge of a church. And there were a lot of things along the way where I could have said, I'm not good enough. I'm going to sit here. Because it's a big deal from playing with the youth on Wednesday nights. All of a sudden, now I got to get up and preach to this church on Sunday morning. I'll tell you what, beloved, Nathan is knocking in the knees to know that next month he's got to do this every Sunday. So all y'all just start smacking him on the back and start encouraging that young. You do. I'm serious. All right. Start praying for these people who will be speaking because I'm going to tell you, like, it's a gift. It's something special. It's something you need the supernatural, not my abilities. All right. But, but his and what he's given me. Now, let me tell you this. I was dumb at 23. I had no fear of failure. I was in Bible college. I knew everything. All right? It was just like I knew everything about parenting before I had kids. I knew every, everything about pastoring and preaching until I had to get up and do it every single Sunday. And I thought every idea I had was just awesome and endorsed by God. Whether I was throwing cigarettes in the offering plate to make the money or to way it would make a point, whether I flipped over an entire tear of China, I cut all my clothes off one Sunday morning down to my boxers. Yes, I did. I was much thinner, much more confident. My physical build, it was okay. I started a contained fire in a room, a quarter this size with the fire marshal in our church. Not happy. I knew Jesus flipped tables. And so you know what I did? One night in an elder meeting, I didn't like what they were doing, so I flipped the table. It all those things. Some were probably right. Some were probably wrong. But you know what? You learn from your mistakes and you keep moving. One of the best times to stand up is when you don't know what you're doing. Brothers and sisters, it is for all of you in this room and for everyone online, please, 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 please know this. Please. The light of the world is in you. The Bible says you have everything you need in Christ Jesus. You have been given talents and the Lord expects every one of you to stand up and multiply them now more than ever. And you know, if you're afraid to get up and try then you failed from the beginning. There's no failure in stepping forward and realizing, I don't know if I can do this. As a matter of fact, that's right where you're supposed to be is when you don't know what to do. So you have to walk in faith in the process. So don't let the fear of failure hold you back. Oh, in this one, <laughs> I'm too busy. I'm too busy. <sighs> And so for all of us who are too busy, you guys are like, now you won't be preaching. You'll find out how, how too busy you are to serve in the church too bad. Let's come talk to you in a few months from now. No, all right, we're too busy. And so what does God gift? What, what, what does God get in return? He doesn't get double of what we have. He gets the leftovers. He gets the left. You know, I hear a terrifying statistic. One quarter of the people that were engaged in church before coronavirus have never been seen, seen again by the church. They just fell away. One quarter. Because they were never engaged to begin with in the process. Think about that. 25% of the capital C church just disappeared because of coronavirus. So it's going to be up on everyone to stand up and shine. But if you try to tell the Lord you're too busy when he's come to reconcile his account, what do you think he's going to say? Goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah, you go, what are you going to do? Regift him? <laughs> we had some friends, some people that uh, I discipled for years back come up two weeks ago. 
And right before they got there, okay, they called and they were like, what, they're actually Corbin's godparents, okay? They just came the week after Christmas to visit. And they called and they're like, hey, we want to get the kids presents. What do they like? And I'm like, you, you know, the kids, don't, don't video. Oh, no, they were, they were just ready to lavish gifts upon my kids. And I called Kristen and I'm like, we already blew our money for Christmas. I'm not having a job. Now I got to get all these presents for their kid and I don't know what to do. And I said, Kristen, hold on. Remember when Corbin got two of the exact same punching bags last year? We've still got a brand new one out in the garage. We'll just give them that. And when they walked in and we sat down and we, we, we got, you know, we got conversation flowing, we kept up, uh, you know, our, all three, our two kids and their kids, they knew it was Christmas. Oh man, you know what Nathan, his name's Nathan, all right? You know what Nathan got my son? An unlimited pass on Nintendo DS. That's worth a fortune. And then they got Reagan, every girly thing you could get under the sun, things we don't want her to have, like makeup. <sighs> and then it came time for sweet Pax, Paxson, their son to open here gift. And it was clear, it was regifted. Now I tried to hold my chin up and be like, no, this is the best gift ever, because Corbin really likes his punching bag. This is true. And I, I wasn't going to tell them it was regifted. I was just still a gift, right? I mean, come on. It's still a gift. I'm still giving him a talent. And do you know what happened? I kid you not. Reagan says, oh, good. We gave him the other punching bag Corbin got last Christmas. <laughs> you think you're going to hide something from God? Seriously. I was too busy. I helped out at a VBS 17 years ago. One time, I think I went to an upward event, went to one women's Bible study. I gave some money, God. It's okay. And he's going to be like, that is not what I called you to do whatsoever. You were too busy on focusing what the world was as the Lord. You were too busy not using your talents. And you were too busy at twisting them for your own gain. I don't want to look at Jesus Christ at the end, bow down and say, I was too busy. I don't want to do that. I don't want to say I was too busy to get you anything. I was too busy. I wasn't a good steward enough of my money. And so I'm just going to try to regift you something. It's the same as this guy. And finally, a lot of us say, I just didn't know. I didn't know it was going to be this serious. I didn't know it was going to be this hard. Because a lot of us, what do we do? We pick passages of Scripture and we say, yes, I believe in this. And we pray, yes, I believe in all, all of us are yes and amen. We're like, Jesus' return. Yeah, but put in this context, this ought to concern everyone in this room. Because even like we talked about last week with focus, if you just go through the motions, right, and worship and God looks at you and he's like, I'm not going to answer your prayers. Your worship is, it nauseates me. Just stop doing it. Okay. You're better off not doing it at all than if you're just going through the motions. This does not make God happy. Those are people who hear and don't listen. Those are people who don't focus on Emmanuel with them as they go about using what God has given all of us to glorify him and to be reconciled at the end of the day. We say, I didn't know. I didn't know it was going to be that harsh. Isn't he a God of love? Isn't he a God of grace? Yes, he is. He's a God of love who started by giving humanity himself in the garden. It was all good. And then when they messed it up, we, he didn't mess it up. We messed it up. And you say, God's not loving and graceful. I say, well, what are you talking about? He is pretty loving and graceful. He said, you messed it up, but I will provide a way. I'm the way. I'm not I. Jesus is the way. I. The truth and the life and no one will come through the Father except through me. He is loving. He is graceful, but he does have expectations. That LaGrange, you got talent. And now's the time for everyone in this room to step up and use your gifts at a whole new level. Bob, new time. I know you're retiring 55 plus. We're going to find something else for you. All right. I'm going to throw you in. I'm going to write some recommendations to the board. Whether they like it or not, I put Bob at even bigger responsibility. All right. Like, he expects it to the end. If we truly believed that, 
If we truly believed he was coming back, that he entrusted us with this talents, he expects them to be multiplied. Isn't this a great time for every one of you to stand up and serve? This is a great time for every single one of you to get up and use your talents. This is your time to break the limitations and the molds of the idea that that you have to have one senior pastor. No, I see hundreds, thousands online, yet have what? Talents and gifts. Maybe, just maybe, sometimes when God calls people away and we don't understand why, he's saying, oh, because I'm ready to unleash Bruce Burns at levels he's never been unleashed at before. Oh, ho, 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 ho. You thought you saw a lot from Judy Dar. You ain't seen nothing yet. I heard a story from Dr. Sharp that she gave him a cat mouth to mouth resuscitation. I don't know how that gift is a spiritual gift, but the cat's alive. (laughs) You never know what God can do through you unless you step up. And you can choose to think, that this is going to be a bad time until God brings your next lead shepherd. Or you could choose to look at this and go, this is an opportunity like no other. Yeah, this may put a little holy fear in you. But sometimes a little holy fear is good, isn't it? Sometimes it pushes us just a little bit further to step up. Because if we truly believe things where we're a little holy fear, we do them. I'm going to tell you, okay? At the end, what fear will do to you? The biggest fear I had, and the band can come up, that I can remember where I was like, this is going to happen and I got to do it, was going into junior high. And you know what I was afraid of in junior high? Okay. The only thing I was afraid of was wall lockers with combinations. No, I was. I had never done one before. And I remember every day I obsessed uh, yeah, yeah, all right, get ready. 28, 8, 28. I was so scared in the seventh grade at 43, I can tell you right now what my first combination was. I didn't know how to work a lock. I wasn't going to know my combination. And I was so determined that I wasn't going to get locked out of my locker on the first day of middle school that I went and every day I would go to people who knew how to spin it twice, one and a half, one and a I don't even think I could. Yes. Okay, I do. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I was so set because I knew it was going to happen. I knew I was going to have to face it. And I was so scared and so determined. I still, to this day, remember 28, 8, 28. Because I knew it was real, I knew it was coming, and I wasn't going to get left out of my locker. That's a worldly thing. Now, brothers and sisters, if you believe it, then shouldn't you have that same motivation to step in in a way you never have before? I mean, if you'll stay up nights to remember, so much so that you did it to you remember 30 years later for a silly wall locker because I didn't want to be kept out. Well, shouldn't all of us have maybe just a little holy fear to dig in a little bit harder right now? To believe in the priesthood of the saints? To believe that God has given LaGrange talent and it will be judged. But let me assure you of this. You have a mission that moves. You have all the right people in all the right places. You have Emmanuel with you. And yes, he came and gave, but he will come again. Listeners will take this call and do it. And I pray that everyone in this room and online listens like you've never listened before. Because he may call you into something you never know and it will take you to a whole new place in life. Don't lose your focus. I should never have been your focus. And I can say this, one thing I worked hard on for six years is that I wasn't Jesus. Because I wanted you to know Jesus. And know me. But I wanted you to remember that. Keep your focus on him. Keep putting light in dark places because this is coming. 
I think with all my heart that when he comes back and sees people from the Grange Church of God and he does, you know, their talents, I love the fact that I can say I know a church in the Grange, Indiana that had so much talent, it oozed in such a way that the light that was in them shined so bright that they truly were an example of a city shining on a hill. But today, I challenge you all, let's all take one step forward. Let's believe that the Spirit of God is in me and He's in you and He's in you online. All of us who choose to call on Him as Savior, now's the time to step up bigger than you've ever stepped up before. And it's not because you have to. It's because you get to. Because God trusts you, Lenoka. God trusts you, Patty. He trusts you, Kathy. He trusts you, Jane Noel, to keep moving. He's entrusted all this to all of you. I believe so long as you follow Emmanuel, so long as you keep your focus, so long as you listen, and so long as you're a good steward of your talents, the best is yet to come. So my question for you this morning is, are you willing to get on stage and try? Not this stage. Are you willing to step up? Are you willing to try your talents? Do you believe this is going to happen? Just put a little fire under you. This doesn't have to be the end. This can be the next chapter of a story that's never been heard before. Let me pray. Almighty God, I can't help but say thank you. I just, I look at all these faces and I say thank you. Thank you for the talents that you've given so many in this congregation. Thank you that they've been obedient. Thank you that your word pushes us one step forward to you so we can shine ever brighter till the full light of day. No, oh God, right now, would you hear our hearts? Would you hear our fears? Would you give us faith to believe that you have something even bigger and better, not just for this church, but each and every child of God in this room? who has been entrusted by you, the creator of the world, with talents. Help them move in such a way like the one with five and the one with two, that they don't bury, but they go out and multiply. I know, I know it's within these, these believers. I know it's within these disciples. I choose to believe that this church, that these people, oh Lord, have a nudge. So give them that faith to have that nudge, to listen, to focus, and to show off their talents. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with us? You take.
salvation, Christ alone. Let's go out and let's share that with others. Let's let's use the talents, these gifts that God has given within us. Let's not leave these things on the table. God wants to use you today. Not, this sounds like a great idea. Yeah, this is great, Pastor Ben. No, let's, let's walk out these doors. Let's be changed. And let's impact lives and let's use these gifts that God has given each and every one of you and you too online. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this reminder. God, you've given us each all very different looking talents and gifts that we are supposed to use to glorify you, Father. Let us do that. Let us do that when we walk out of here. Let us shine your light. Let us put light in dark places. Lord, let don't let busyness get in the way. Don't let other things, distractions, God, let our eyes just be fixed on you, your kingdom, Lord. Love you. We love you, Lord. Thank you for this church family. 
thank you for this body as we move forward. And all God's people said, amen. Let's raise our hands and receive the blessing today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine down upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Let's go and shine our light today.